I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you will. We're going to go to the book of Zephaniah. You say, preacher, what did you just say? <laughs> Zephaniah. The book of Zephaniah. When you get there, just stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to the third chapter this afternoon. Zephaniah chapter 3. We're going to begin our reading for the text in verse 14. We're going to read to the end of the book. In this last chapter. prophet writes, verse 14, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments, he hath cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee, thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not. And to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. Sorry, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Verse 18, I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that wherever we go in search of your Son, in search of this great story of the gospel, we can find you. Even if it's not a recording, Lord, of his actual life on earth, we can find the theme and we can find the purpose and we can find your original intention in every page of this blessed book. And so with it tonight, by the help of the Holy Spirit, I ask you to speak to our hearts, I ask you to change our lives, transform our minds, quicken our spirits, and restore us even this hour. Help us, God, to serve you faithfully. Lord, take these words, God, to heed tonight. Let this word get in the deep, deepness of our heart and our soul. Lord, let there be healing. Lord, fill those places, God, that are empty in us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I ask you, in Jesus' name, church said, amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. This evening, I want to acknowledge some things. Now that we are 21 books into this study in the Old Testament, we've spent a good bit of time so far, and we've begun to see a consistent thread involving a course of rebellious people and a faithful God. And that's what the prof prophetic books in the Old Testament are in the Bible to say to us, and it's the same thing really kind of over and over. People are rebellious. Even God's people are found rebellious. But God himself insists on doing eternally good things for his people, even in their rebellion. 
is what one prophet after another is trying to drive into a group of people's heads and even in our heads and our hearts as we read this. And because rebellious people are unable to work through uh, what they're uh, in and uh, work their way out of their own rebellion, God takes matters here in his own hands to secure the deliverance for them. Uh, the prophet Zephaniah, the book we're reading out of this afternoon, follows a familiar pattern. Uh, the book begins with a declaration of the judgment that is coming on God's people, but not just his people, but even God's enemies. But by the end of the book and where we were reading at the end, in chapter 3, we see assurances of God's saving love that might seem to some who don't understand true sovereignty, to them it might seem like a contradiction to his earlier declarations of judgment in the book. So the question would arise maybe, how can God treat his people mercifully when justice calls for necessary judgment upon them because of their behavior, because of their disobedience and you read the first two chapters in full, and I encourage you to do so, you'll see that perhaps no other prophet in the Old Testament gave a more definite declaration of the terror of God's divine judgment against sin itself. We're told by some expositors that Zephaniah, at the time of writing this prophecy, was probably 24 or 25 years old when he spoke the prophecy and this time in his life and I say to that let no one look at you and despise you and hinder you because of your youth God can use anybody anytime the way he wants to because he is the sovereign Lord but Zephaniah starts his book off and he's only about really talking about the sin of the people and the sudden judgment of God that's about to come upon their sin you look with me in chapter 1 of Zephaniah. The Bible says in verse 1, The word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of His Hizkiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. He says, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven." and the fishes of the sea, and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place in the name of the Chimurims with the priests. He said, verse 5, And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm, and them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. So we see in these few verses the day of the Lord's judgment coming on Judah. And upon Jerusalem. We see the people again resorting back to, of course, their old ways. Disorder is all over the land. Chaos is spread abroad. And all along in this first chapter, leading into the beginning of the second chapter, Zephaniah here, he, he's painting all these poetic pictures of the end of Jerusalem. And then he goes down to verse 12 in chapter 1. And writes, and it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their God, their goods, shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. And he says it again, it is near. And hasteth greatly. 
Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Verse 16, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men. They shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. He said in verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So, while we do have a declaration of coming judgment, we don't just have that declaration. We also have the reason for its coming. Remember what he said in verse number 4 of chapter 1. He says, I'm going to stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He says, I'm going to cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the cherubims with the priests. And then they'll worship the host of heaven upon the housetops. And then they'll worship and that swear by the Lord that swear by Malcolm. And them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. It's the promise of judgment. And you see what he said in verse number 2 of chapter 1. In verse number 3 he says, I'll utterly consume all the things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks of the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I repeat these verses because of the understanding we must have of the desolation that is coming. It wasn't just for that day for Jerusalem and Judah, but it, it's for our day that is soon approaching. This declaration is broad enough to include the whole earth and, and even to allow maybe some to think that God didn't really mean them when he was talking. Uh, you, now, you know, here's God and he's, he, he's focusing in on his people in the land of Judah. And he's not going to allow them to think that he only spoke to others and not them. What God was announcing was judgment against idol worship in Israel. And we can see here that, that God's promises to cut off every trace of Baal and destroy the rest of the idolatry was fulfilled. We also see that this prophecy was an invitation. In other words, it's as if God himself said, as like I'm talking to you tonight, Baal and, and the idols of Baal are going to go. You can get rid of them by righteousness, by turning away from it and turning unto me, or I will just get rid of them in judgment. But either way, they are going to go. And, and I think about that, and I, you know, when God says something's going to be, it's going to be, no matter what anybody else says or does about it. And it's not just a call of repentance in the Old Testament days. It wasn't just a call of repentance when the church was birthed in Acts. It's a, still a call of repentance in 2024 to turn from your idolatry, to turn from your idol worship, to turn from your wicked ways and turn back to God because not just then in that day was he destroying cities, but this time he's going to burn the earth up. And that's a promise. And if God says he'll do it, he's going to do it. You see, bell worship, it was the worship literally, if I had time to talk about the history of it, and I don't, but it was the worship of everything literally under the sun plus the S-U-N, sun. Everything literally besides the one true living God would they worship. Things that unimaginably in that day would do, we're even seeing in our day today. Bestiality, killing of young babies, 
uh, same-sex orientations and, and so on and so forth. You can just use your adult imagination and run with it. It was happening and it's running rampant in our day and running rampant in our age. And many think that God has lost control of everything and everybody. But for those of you that have, have that belief or, 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 or convinced that that's the way it is, you need to realize that the sovereign Lord of the universe is actually extending His mercy right now to those who have turned from Him unto other idols. And guess what? His love is still extending a time, just a short time, but to those who want to wake up to the reality of eternity before it's too late. Listen to what he said through the prophet in chapter 12 and verse number 1, or uh, chapter 1 and verse 12, excuse me. He said, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves, that they say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. This word uh, candle in the Old Testament here in the Hebrew is really the, where we get the word lamps. So that tells me nobody that tries to run from God is going to be able to hide against his judgment. It is coming, and even God's going to get the lamps out to find the people. He's, he, you'll not be able to run from God. His judgment will come, and it will find you no matter where you run to. He continues on in that verse and talks about punishing the men that are settled on their leaves. He's referring to those that have come become complacent. Those that have become comfortable in their way of living. They no longer really have uh, what some would call a conscience. They no longer, uh, they have turned so far from God in rebellion and, and, and literally said, there's nothing that you can offer me that is any good for me. I want nothing else to do with you. And have ran as far from the presence of the Lord as they could possibly do. And now have become comfortable in the way of their living. Well, let me say to them, even this hour, uncomfort is coming very soon. You better turn to God. Because the Lord's promising judgment. Everything up until now that God has promised in His Word has come to pass. What is in the book of Revelation really is the only thing that has not happened yet. There's nothing holding the Lord back from coming other than God looking at His Son and saying, Go get Him. It's time. We better take heed to the Word of God. So here's people that are detached from God and, and, and what really are detached from life itself. And so they become comfortable. And he continued in verse 12. And he said, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. These people are making these statements. And some people believe in God as a, I don't know if this would even make sense to some, but like a great clockmaker. This is how I think of it. He creates the universe. He kind of winds it up like a clock. And then he just kind of leaves it ticking without any further intervention. It's just going to, you're just going to live forever. And, and, and tomorrow's going to come and you got plenty of time. And, and, and nothing's ever going to go bad for you. You're just going to live. And as a guy on uh, this uh, podcast the other day, it was an atheist having a, uh, a, a debate with a Christian and he said, do you not believe in afterlife? He goes, no, I'm just here, and then I'm just eventually going to die right away and go back to the dust. Those who believe that there is no God, that there is no eternity, that there is no eternal life or eternal death, or even that God exists at all, that there's not even a creator in the heavens, they're tragically wrong. They're so far from the truth, it's scary. And it's terrible what's going to happen to them one day if they don't open their eyes to the truth. There was a man by the name of Edward Gibbon who wrote a book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And in the book, he 
in a section of it, he describes the attitudes towards religion in the last days of the Roman Empire. And these attitudes are really very similar to like the attitudes in our world today. But he mentions that in that day, the people regarded all religions as equally true. Christianity was just as true as Buddhism. And, and, and all across the board, everything was just equally true. He said that the philosophers regarded all religions as equally false. And the politicians regarded all religions as equal, equally useful. It's really no different in our day, is it? And it was no different in Zephaniah's day. We come into chapter 2, and then God, by the prophet, amps up the message by giving a last chance warning. Hear what the Lord says to the prophet. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. He said, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the shaft, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. He said, verse 3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. We, all the announcement." Of judgment in the previous chapter, chapter 1, is understood as a warning and as an invitation to repent and turn back to God. And there's, there's often an un, uh, unwritten thing behind almost every prophet in the Old Testament and what they say and the message that God speaks to them of judgment, and that is. This is what's going to happen to you if you don't repent. And there's no man or woman of God that can stand up and declare that, well, God may change his mind right before. No. What God says will be, will be. And there's no erasing it, changing it, or editing it. It's going to happen. And preacher, well, that's real elementary. Sure it is. But as elementary as it is, there's some people that still don't believe it and still refuse to believe it. They don't want to accept the truth. It's hate to people that don't like the truth. And then we look at chapter 3. As we come into chapter 3, we see something totally different going on. But, but look one more time with me before we, we go into it. Because there's something that happens between the warnings of chapter 1 and 2 and the rejoicing in chapter 3 that we read in the text. Look at verse 3 again in chapter 2 and then we'll move on. He says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. Listen to this. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Pay attention to that. Remember that. What is, what is that saying to us? It's what I said a moment ago. This message isn't just for the right, uh, just for the, the sinners. This is also a message for the righteous. Because even the righteous need to take heed to the warning of the word of the Lord. It would do to them no good to say that, well, the Lord just, you know, speaks to my wicked neighbor, but he, he really isn't talking to me when he says this. But at a critical moment of national danger and disaster around us, even the righteous better be seeking the Lord. And that's a good message for what's going on that we found out in the last 24 to 48 hours on the news with the war in Israel, with the conflict now between the U.S. and Iran, and I'm not trying to get end times prophetic with you like I've got a lot of knowledge about it, but I will say to you this, there is something coming up on the earth, and it is coming quickly, and it will not just shake the earth. The, the shaking and the speaking is coming from the heavens because God speaks in, in the book of Hebrews, and he says this. He says, one time I spoke from the earth, but now I will speak from the heavens. I will shake the earth from the heavens. And he says, do not refuse he that speaketh. 
I can't tell you what's coming in the latter days, but there's coming a quick shift in the earth. And you better know that you know that you know that you know who your God is. So we find the prophet giving warning to seek the Lord, to notice his judgment, to go after his righteousness, to look for his meekness, that it may be that you could be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. I read that and I'm reminded of what Isaiah said in the 55th chapter of his book. Where God speaks to him in verse 3 and says, Incline your ear." And come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. He says behold I have given him for a witness to the people. A leader and a commander to the people. Behold thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee. Because of the Lord thy God. And for the Holy One of Israel. For he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the uprighteous, the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And listen to this in verse 12. Think about what we read in our text in Zephaniah. He says, For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Why? Because of what we heard in verse 12. There is a cause, but there's also an effect. Look at verse 12 again in chapter number 3. Listen to what he says. I will also leave thee in the midst of thee and afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. He tells them they're going to go out with joy. He tells them that they're going to be led forth with peace. He tells them in Isaiah 55, 12, that the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And the why they are able to do so is found a few verses earlier in verse 7 of Isaiah 55. Listen to what he said. Remember, he said, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So just like Zephaniah, the prophet Isaiah, impresses the need for repentance among God's people. Repentance is just simply turning around our way, turning from our own way, our old way, turning our thinking away from where it's directed and back to God. That's what repentance is. It's allowing your thinking to be changed, allowing your mind to be transformed. Simply, this is what it means to return to the Lord. Of course, when he speaks through the prophets, he says, return to the Lord, judgment's coming. That's what this means. And I would say to somebody this evening, you can't walk on God's way until you turn from yours. You can't do it. It's not a two-lane highway. You're going either his direction or you're going your direction. 
The Lord has a restoration that wants to work in us and through us, but it takes repentance for him to work on us. I'm trying to hurry. Isaiah, he, he made an important point when he wrote uh, this, this chapter and the unrighteous man talking about his thoughts and wickedness. Uh, uh, he, he's talking about a wicked people in a wicked way and, and uh, how it can be demonstrated by our actions, meaning our way of living, the way we think is right or the way that a man thinks is right. But unrighteousness can be found in your actual thoughts. This is the mind. I think we talked about this in the car on the way up here uh, this morning. But it's always been about the mind and how Christ really focused on the mind. The battleground for a righteous walk with the Lord is often found in the mind. It's found in our thoughts. And he says that if this people does so, he meaning God will have mercy on them. Now that's a glorious promise to have the judgment and wrath pointed right at you and then suddenly be able to find a way out of that. When you turn to the Lord, he will have mercy on you. And in fact, he will abundantly pardon you. The, the problem is never that we turn to the Lord and find that he rejects us. The problem is that we fail to return to the Lord. If you'll come to him, he won't reject you. He'll in no otherwise cast you out. He'll accept you. But you have to allow him to change you. You can't come to him and say, God, I want you, but I want to keep this, and I want to continue to do this, and I want that. <coughs> I've heard it preached for years. Oh, he loves you just the way you are. No, he doesn't, because if he did, Calvary would have never had to happen. No, he loves you, and if you'll come to him, he can change who you are. He will pardon, but we must return to him. And so in chapter 3 here, the Bible says, God's speaking again through the prophet. <coughs> Excuse me, in verse 7, he said, I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thou wilt receive instruction. So their dwelling should not be cut off, howsoever I punished them. But they rose early and corrupted all their doings. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to, pray, to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with fire of my jealousy. Then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my disperse, shall bring my offering. And that day shalt thou not be ashamed before all my, thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. Then I will take it away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, Thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. In verse 7, it's as if God is saying here, after all I've done, after all I've promised to do for you, surely thou will fear me. Surely you will reverence my name. Surely you will bow humbly before me. Surely thou wilt receive my instruction so their dwelling should not be cut off. And yet some didn't. But for those who did, we have to understand God's not extending mercy just for us. And remember, it, it's not just the call to the sinners, it's the call to the righteous. Why? Because the righteous have got to get it in line so the world out there can get it in line. You can't get the sin out of the world until you get the sin out of the church. So God's calling the people to be holy and righteous and humble before Him. Why? He said, because there'll be a poor people I'll leave before you that's going to need you. 
those that are humble before me, those that are those that are uh, obedient to me, they're going to come to you because they're going to need help. They're going to need someone to guide them. They're going to need someone to tell them the truth. So some didn't, but for those that did, mercy is extended once again. But he says in verse number 8 of chapter 3, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. And then he gets to our text in verse 14. And as I close, I want to read it. He said in verse 14, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad, rejoice with all thy heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. Then he said in verse 17, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with sin. After the promises of taking away their sin, here he follows with promises of taking away their trouble. It, it's, it's, it's a great day when you can bow before a holy God and confess your sins and have your, have your slate wiped clean and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. But it's an even greater day when that same God takes that trouble that sin tried to just destroy your life with and take it away from you. What a day that is. You remember I mentioned, and I'm, I'm closing with this, about cause and effect. Because when the cause is removed, the effect will cease. Everything fades away. Not, not perfect life to you, but all that that sin destroyed your life with suddenly begins to fade away because of surrender. I like what Matthew Henry said. He said, what makes a people holy will make them happy, of course. I want to say that those who truly love God with all their heart have a reason with all their heart to rejoice in Him. He promises to remove your sins and then your fear is silenced. And I've I found that many people who have been silenced by fear, when the fear is removed, they're no longer silent. Because it throws off discouragement and it brings wonderful peace and joy and unspeakable full of glory when that fear leaves you. When, when a person's spirits are down, and I see this daily, Everything else is too, but but see their when their spirits are lifted up, you see their voice come up, you see their hands come up, you you, you see praises come up once again. So before we pray, I'm gonna close with this and Izzy if you'll help me, honey. I heard somebody say this, and I wrote this down for I guess such a time as this. They said, fear makes the hands slack. But faith and hope make them vigorous. And the joy of the Lord will be our strength, both for doing and for suffering. You say, well, that, that's semi-encouraging. You can try to be joyful. You can try to be happy through circumstances. But if you've got fear overtaking you, and if you've got worry and doubt overtaking you, 
You can't fake it till you make it. Those things will overtake you if you don't have something real and tangible driving you. And so we have to surrender to God and let him touch us and, and let him help us and let him heal us and let him strengthen us. And when we do and he wipes that fear away and wipes that sorrow away and wipes that grief away, there's a strength that comes from within and a joy that will come from within that doesn't make sense in the middle of our circumstances. It, it's, it's, it's what Paul calls peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't make sense to have the joy, and it doesn't make sense to have the peace. But it's to a people that don't understand the God that we serve. So that's why we need to be close to him, so that we might explain it to them before it's too late. So we'll bow our heads tonight, and I'm done. As the song says, Jesus knows all about our struggles, and he will guide till the day is done, and there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one. I can't sugarcoat it, I can't change anything, I just have to tell you the way it is, and, and, and then this is it. You either have God or you don't. You either have true peace or you don't. You have joy or you don't. And you can have it, and it's not complicated, and it don't cost you everything in your bank account, your house, your car, anything like that, although that seems to be what's going on in our world today, that you can't afford to live. But I would say all God wants is you, all of your heart and all of your life. And I'll tell you this, you can't afford to live without him. Cannot afford to live without him. So come to Jesus. That's all I, all I have is come to Jesus, confess your sins, and there's hope for you. Hope for tomorrow. Even if tomorrow doesn't come, you'll be with him. If you don't turn to him, you're not living for him. There's no hope. It's over with. And I don't want to see anybody go down that road. Would you turn to him tonight in Jesus' name? We'll gather here this afternoon. Can we just pray?